I'm going to bring you a message today from our All In series. Uh, it's called Inconvenient. It's going to be a little bit of an inconvenient sermon this morning. And we're going to have a great time. And, and I, there's one part that I haven't been able to get an amen in any of the, the earlier services, but I'm counting on you guys to be able to amen at this part, okay? All right, we're going to end up in Genesis chapter 6, verse number 5 in just, just a few moments. But I want to talk to you about why we're doing this All In. And I think one of the best examples I've learned about All In... Uh, I picked up just a few years ago when, uh, uh, remember when kind of the cool Christmas presents was, was a Texas Hold'em set? Do you remember that? Some of you are going, I'm not going to confess to playing poker in church. <laughs> you remind me of the guys who came to me one time and they said, Pastor, Pastor, will you go, will you go to the casino with us? I said, I'm not going to the casino. They said, listen, listen, we'll give you all the money you want to gamble with. I said, What? They said, you won't be losing a dime. It won't even be ours. I said, what are you saying? And they said, well, our wives won't let us go, but if you go, we know they'll let us go. I said, that doesn't make it right. But, you know, when I was a kid, you weren't even allowed to touch a deck of cards because it was sin. But something shifted in that. Something changed. And a few years ago, we all got into this Texas Hold'em thing and, and playing it. And it was a great time. And, 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 and I, want, I want you to, I've picked on him all, all the other service. I'm going to pick on Pastor Danny for just a moment. I, I realize don't play against Pastor Danny. He wants to win every game he plays, but he didn't just want to win. He wants to demolish you. <laughs> and so I'm sorry, but it's true. Uh, but uh, uh, So I'm, I'm playing with him on purpose because I'm trying to learn. And who, who better to watch than somebody that's, that's just winning? And, and I'll never forget, you know, what, what I had to learn from him and I had to try it a few times and it backfired once or twice. But, but I, I realized uh, finally when I had the game how it worked. What happens when you get a hand of cards that you know there is no way. I mean, there is no way you're going to lose. You have, you have all the winning cards. And then you look down and you realize that you might have a winning hand, but you only have a small little reserve left in your pot. What do you do? Well, there's only one thing you can do to try to maximize that winning hand, and that's what you have to go See, y'all have played. I know. Look at there. You have to go all in. And when you go all in knowing that you're going to win because you see the cards at hand, I cannot think of a better illustration of what we're trying to explain, explain during this series, that you need to learn to go all in for Jesus. What I mean by that is when Jesus is in your hand, you have a winning hand. You, there is nothing you can push to the center of the table for Jesus that he can't take care of for you. There is nothing that God cannot provide for you. And I think the reason that we don't go all in is because we don't really have the confidence in our hand that we need to have. We don't have the confidence in God in every area of our life that we need to have. So we're having a series dealing with that, wanting you to understand the importance of going all in for God. Wanting you to understand that, listen to me carefully, the re reason some of you are missing out is because you're holding out. And you've been holding out because you're afraid that if you go all in for God that somehow you're going to miss out. But the truth is the complete opposite. The only way you're going to get everything that God has for you is when you're willing to go all in for God. So with that said, let's bow our heads and ask God to open the word to us today. Father, I thank you for this passage we're about to read. I know that it has effect because all the word profits much. Lord, speak to us clearly and speak to us through this scripture today as we move forward and we truly want to know what it means to be all in, to trust the fact that when we have you on our side, we are always in the winning quadrant. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, Genesis chapter 6, we're going to start in verse number 5. Genesis chapter 6, verse number 5 says, the Lord saw, notice this, how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth. And that every inclination of the thoughts and of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. God saw that the human nature had come to a place that all it wanted to do was do wrong. All it wanted to do was to sin, okay? Watch this. The Lord, here, I underline this, highlight this. The Lord regretted. Wow. It's given us the character of God here. God was sorry that he had made human beings on the earth. Notice this. And his heart 
was deeply grieved. I want you to see this about God. God regretted, he was sorry he had made humans, and then he was brokenhearted. Is that this big angry God we've always imagined? God looked down and he saw that man was sinful and it broke his heart. Remember that as we read on. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret, I'm sorry that I even made them. But Noah, thank God for Noah, can I get an amen? amen. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all the people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch outside. And this is how you're to build it. God says, this, I'm going to be real specific. This is how you're to build it. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. Make a roof for it and, and leaving below the roof an opening one cubit high all the way around and put a door in the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks. 17 says this. I am going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens, every creature that has the breath of life in it, everything on earth will perish. Are you with me there? He says it's going to be bad. But notice verse 18. But I will establish my covenant with you. I don't know if you get this, but God's looking to establish a covenant with you. I want to talk to you about that more in just a moment. Let's finish this reading. And you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives, with you. Verse 19, you are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal, and every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. You are to take every kind of food. Praise God for food. Amen. It's almost lunchtime. Can I get a better amen than that? That is to be eaten and stored away as food for you and for them. Notice verse Number 22. Are you ready for this? Help me with this verse. Are you ready? Here we go. And Noah did most of what God wanted. Oh, watch out now. Noah did what he felt like would please God. Noah did, went as far as he felt like was justified. How could we read this? That Noah did everything that God commanded him. Noah went all in for God. Let's come back through this passage real fast. The very first thing I asked you to notice was that God had a broken heart. I think we have a wrong image of God. I think we have this great image that God is somehow in heaven, he's, and he's looking at Jesus, and he's having, we're having a bet going here, and he's like, uh, look, 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 they're about to fail, they're about to fail. Oh, you owe me another galaxy. I mean, I think we feel like God's just waiting for us because he's somehow going to figure out that he's made a mistake and he's going to be mad at us because we sinned again. And I know none of you have ever repented over the same sin a thousand times. But somebody at least make me feel I'm not the only one. We all struggle over and over and over and over and over again. And the God, we feel like God's sitting up there going, well, well, that's the last time. I can't take it. No, that's not the image of God that I want you to get. It's not the image of God that we see here in this passage. What God says here in this passage, and it makes so much sense and it's so powerful, is what we're seeing is that God sees the sin of man and instead of God getting angry about it, He breaks His heart. He says, why? 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 You have so much potential. You don't have to live that way. You don't have to act that way. You don't have to keep going back to that trough. You don't have to keep acting in this sin. You don't have to. And it breaks God's heart because, you see, God wants to be in relationship with us. And sometimes in relationships, we have to understand, and, and, and I had to learn this, that, that I have to value the feelings of the other people in my relationship. I have to realize that it's important that I not be callous and hard and that I, I consider what is my action going to do to this person. How, how am I going to respond? What's it going to cause? What tr trouble is it going to bring? I'll never forget I have a friend, and, and, and I hope that he doesn't call me and hear this and go, was that me? But, but you know what? Uh, uh, I, I just remember one day we were sitting in, in uh, an environment together, and he made a flippant com uh, comment criticizing somebody. But what he didn't think about was when, when, as he criticized that person, I was exactly the same way. 
And it cut me so deep. And he, he hurt me unintentionally. Sometimes in relationships that happens. You hurt people unintentionally. It's not something you mean to do. It just happens. And because feelings are always involved in relationships. And I want you to get this. God wants to be in relationship with you. But God has feelings. And if every time I fail, he's not sitting up there going, well, there we go again, and I'm ready to smite you. But instead, he's looking at me with a broken heart. <coughs> Excuse me. And he's saying, there can be better for you. There's more for you. You know, as a father, I understand this because, you know, there are times I see my kids do things they shouldn't do and I'm thinking, but you're made for more. I want you to understand this. Sin is a self-inflicted wound. Sin is a self-inflicted wound. When you're living in sin and everything kind of goes awry in your life, it's not that God's up there going, now I'm going to punish you for your sin. What's happening is you, God is allowing you to experience the results of your sin. And sin is not as simple as we sum it up to be. There's actually two kinds of sin that I want to talk to you about this morning. The very first kind of sin is called the, the sin of commission. The sin of commission. And the sin of commission is when you know you should not do it, but you do it anyway. Thank you for one honest amen out of three services. How many of you understand the sin of commission? We live there. We all live in that place of commission. And that's where I drove myself to do it. I spent my hard-earned money to get it to do it. I made arrangements. I made an appointment for sin. I mean, it's true. That's sin. All right? Somebody said to me earlier, said, oh, you're going to preach on sin today? I said, yes. They said, you can preach on every sin but mine. That's the way we feel today. But I want you to get what I'm trying to tell you. Everybody that's listening to me right now, you have committed the sin of commission at some point. And if you just said you have not committed the sin of commission, you just committed the sin of commission as you lied willfully in God's house. We've all done wrong. And we spend a lot of time focusing on don't, 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 don't. But you see, the sin of commission is not the only kind of sin there is in, in the world. Unfortunately, there's another sin, and it's called the sin of omission. See, commission means I'm on a mission. I've, co I've, I've started a mission. I, I'm on a mission to do this wrong. But omission means that I know I should do something, but I don't do it. I know that I need to be kind to the one that was mean to me, but I, I'm not going to do that. You see, that's the sin of omission. It's when I know to do good and the Bible says I don't do it, it's sin unto me. And like even in my own life this morning, I had a moment where as I was walking out the door before I left my home, the Lord spoke to me about something and I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it at all. But I knew I needed to do it. I knew that I needed to give somebody who was at a place of anxiety a little bit of grace because it was what they needed, not what I needed. And so I gave them the grace that they needed because I knew that if I didn't, I wouldn't be obeying God in my own life. You see, omission is when the Bible says, do good unto those who despitefully use you. It's when you don't like your neighbor, but you still have to love your neighbor. If you don't, you have committed the sin of omission. doesn't mean it's easy, but it's a sin not to obey the commands of God. The sins of omission. You see, what this tells us is it's possible that you can do nothing wrong and still do nothing right. Because the Bible tells us that if God cleans out your heart, he says, Jesus says this way, if a man is clean from a demon and the darkness leaves him and everything is clean, that says that demon will come full circle and if he returns and finds it empty, he will go find seven friends and come back in and the man will be more bound than he was in the beginning. Third service, nobody's amen after that story because we don't understand it. Here's what he's saying. He's saying if I clean you up and you get all this out, unless you put the right stuff in, you're going to end up allowing stuff back into your life that shouldn't be there because you don't have the right stuff in. You've got, you're going to put the wrong stuff in, and the wrong stuff's going to get you in trouble. And here's the truth. 
You see, if you spend all your time trying not to do the wrong, you're not going to spend any time doing the right. And so we can't spend all of our time. I mean, I know how it is. There are areas of my life I'm like, whoa, I didn't do that today. Whoa, I didn't do that this week. Man, I beat that for a month, and, and, and I'm so excited about it, but I can't just focus on what I'm not doing. I have to replace it with what I need to do. And just to give you an old kind of way of looking at this, an old-timer said, if you're doing what you should do, you won't have any time to do what you shouldn't do. I'm just going to let that one soak in for a moment. If you're doing what you should do, you're going to have a whole lot less time to do what you shouldn't do. And God's speaking to us this morning that he's wanting us to serve him with all of our hearts and to get all in. And as long as sin is running rampant in our lives, we're never going to get there. And here's the way you're going to begin to defeat sin. Are you ready for this? You're going to do what Noah did. Everything God commands you. And the only way you're going to get there is by going all in for God. And it's not going to be fun all the time. It's going to cost you something sometimes. Isn't it amazing how much stronger the amens are on the morning I talk about the power of God to overcome and through praise? Everybody's like, whoa, hallelujah, I can sing my way to victory. Yes, you can sing your way to victory as you drop off the things that have been holding you back all along the way. And God sent me with a message today to tell you, tell you that there's some things you're going to have to do in your life if you want to go all in for God, if you want to Serve God with everything that's in you. You see, I want us to see that going all in, I mean, there, there's a moment in our lives that we have to make a decision that we realize that I'm going to serve Jesus. And you bow your knee and you begin to the, the, the prayer, you pray, you repent of your sins, you get up, you say, I'm saved. And after that moment, everything's different. But I want you to understand something, it doesn't stop there. Because after that, it gets real inconvenient. What church is going to tell you that this morning? Because the next phrase is, and you must take your, up your cross every single day. It means I'm going to have to begin to serve this God that I just gave my everything to. And people don't like that. They don't like having to change the way they feel. And I've been dealing with a situation in my own life right now, and I'm just going to, I, I don't know why I've had to confess this this morning, but I, I'm just going to say, I want to win. I want to win. There's a side of me that's like, I will win. But if I win, I lose. And what I mean by that is to win, I'm going to have to be somebody that I don't want to be. But to win, I may have to lose to win. And that doesn't excite me because I want to win. He may want to win in a game, but there's some other stuff I want to win with. And I want to win. There's a fire behind my eyes wanting to win. But I will lose. So what I've been doing is I've been beating myself up for hours in prayer going, God, show me how not to lose. I want to win for Jesus. I don't want to lose. And we have to get to that place in our lives that we begin to say, God... I, not my will, but thy will be done. God, I want to live in such a way that shows people I'm sold out and committed to Christ. I think that's what Noah has to do here in this situation. God says to him, build an ark. And it wasn't simple. He had to go all in for this. He had to stop everything else he was doing. Jewish tradition tells us that in order to build the ark, at first he had to plant a forest. And the forest had to grow, and then he harvested the trees, and he was able to build the ark because he'd already used all the trees that could be used in the surrounding areas. And so Noah got into this problem. It cost him everything. And you'd think after the flood came, Noah could be like, Woo, but now we can rest. But it even cost him more than that. Do you know how many animals could be on an ark? 45,000 animals. How many of you would like to have 45,000 pets? Anybody? Yeah, some of you, you can eat prayer after service. 45,000 pets. Let me just put that in perspective for you. You know how many animals are in the Atlanta Zoo? 1,500. 220 species. That's 30 Atlanta zoos. Can you imagine how much mess there is in 30 Atlanta zoos? Noah made a decision. God told me to do it. I'm going to do it no matter what it costs. 
Do you know what it cost Noah? Jewish tradition tells us that Noah couldn't sleep on the ark, that Noah was up around the clock, that he worked trying to feed every animal, that he worked trying to clean out every animal, that he worked to the point that he, start, he got a cough and he started coughing up blood, is what Jewish tradition tells us, that Noah, it cost him everything to serve God. But the thing was, the God that had led him to build an ark was the God who had protected his family and he realized serving God is the only choice there is. I don't know if you understand this or not, but life has brought us to a table in the all the world is betting against us but you hold the one true trump card over everything and that's serving god and when you make your mind up the only thing the only hope my family has the only hope i have is loving god with all that i am not some but all that i am and obeying him to the best of my ability and you go all in for god i want you to understand you will never lose amen and noah had made that decision that he was going to determine to serve God with all that's within him, and he was never going to lose. I think sometimes we over-grammarize the will of God. We think that somehow when we finally break through, everything's going to be perfect from there. But every mountain leads to another mountain. Every battle leads to another battle. But the thing is, as you grow in God, listen to me, as you grow in God, the things that set you back now are going to become just molehills in front of you. They're not going to set you back anymore. And the thing you thought you could never beat, you're not only going to beat it, you're going to help others beat it. Why? Because you're going to grow stronger in God. And as you go through the fire, you're going to come forth the way God wants you to. I don't want anybody to say we're not preaching the truth over here. I've told you, you need Jesus, and sin will take you to hell. And I want you to get this, that you need to live like the born-again child that God's called. It's time to take those things off, but it'll cost you something. It'll cost you the win so you can win. It'll cost you whether or not you can speak your mind the way you've always spoke your mind. Uh, I think I heard some oh me's in the middle of that. Let me, let me move on in my sermon. You see, when you look back over your life, it's going to be the hard things, the impossible things that you went after in the name of Jesus Christ that, and he gave you the power to do it. Those are going to be the greatest days of your life. You know, I want you to get what I think my job is as a pastor, okay? I want you to just understand this. I think my job as a pastor is to comfort the afflicted. Okay? But I also think my job as a pastor is to afflict the comfortable. That if you've reached a comfortable place in your life, that you realize God's wanting to bring you out of that apathy. And He's wanting to give you a fire and a passion. Pastor Don, why do you believe this? I'll tell you why I believe this. Because I have watched it work. I'm not supposed to stand here, and I know I've said this before, but I'm not supposed to stand here. I am just the descendant of Native Americans who were abusive and drunk. I am supposed to be umpteenth generation abusive drunk. That's who I'm supposed to be. You see, I remember the Sundays after the Friday, Saturday drunks. I remember the abuses, the attacks, the assault. I remember the darkness that comes from that kind of thing. And I watched as my parents made a decision, and they made a decision, we'll either be all in at the bar like everybody else, or we're going to go all in at God's altar, and we're going to serve God. And now today, I don't stand, and my kids don't know those darkness. They don't know those moments. They don't, they don't know that. Why? Because somebody made a decision to serve God. And because somebody made a decision to serve God, they laid a path out that's helped me make a decision to serve God. And I don't want to see anybody go down those roads. And, and listen, the reason I believe this, and I'm preaching it to you and telling you that every day of a Christian life is not going to be perfect, but every day of a Christian life is better than what it could be. Every day of a Christian life gets you further and closer to where God wants you to be, and you can move to a better place in Christ Jesus. I want you to get this today. I've not preached this sermon this way in either of the other two services, but you need this this morning. It's time for you to dust off yourself Stand up, take your, your, your position in the blood-bought position of Jesus Christ and determine we're not going back, we're not going to falter, we're not going to be in and out of God's house, we're going to plant our feet, we're going to serve Jesus, we're going to walk this walk, and when we're done and all the dust is settled, we're still going to be standing, we're still going to be lifting up Jesus, and because we have gone all in on a hand that cannot lose, and it's called the power of God. Amen. 
I thought I wasn't going to yell. I made it three services without yelling. But apparently somebody's hard-headed in this service and needs it. Come on now, amen. You see, when you move forward in life, it doesn't mean it's going to get easier. Sometimes moving forward in life complicates things. I, I, I said I wouldn't say it in front of her, but I'm going to go ahead and say it. When I married that little lady right there, it complicated my life. But it was a good complication. You see, the next morning I got up and I thought I had it all planned out. And I was like, this is how it's going to be. And she said, really? And I realized she had a different opinion. And we had to start building a family. And it wasn't but about four, three, four years, almost four years later, God complicated our life some more. And we got a, a baby and then another and another. And God just blessed us and complicated our world. I, you know what the best illustration for how, how blessing will complicate your life is? I, I, when I go to the convenience store. My dad was one of those guys, let's get us a Coke and a, a candy bar. I just loved it. He's like, let's get us a Coke and a candy bar. Charlie loves that now, too. I mean, all Wednesday night, he's like, he's like, be bad, Dad. I was like, what? He said, be bad, Dad. I said, what do you mean, be bad, Dad? Oh, you want to go to the convenience store. <laughs> I call it bad dad moments. But you see, I used to walk in the convenience store, and I'd come out with my Coke in one hand and my candy bar in the other, and that was it. Now I come out $45 later with two bags. Wondering why we didn't go to Walmart instead. <laughs> See, it complicated things. When you serve God, your life's going to get a little more complicated because God's going to expect something out of you. As a matter of fact, it's going to get plumb out of inconvenient. God's going to expect you to do what you don't want to do because He wants you to do everything the way He commanded. And sometimes it's going to be painful. I'm so far off track on this sermon, I don't know what slides we missed, and I have no clue where we are. But I'm going to tell you this. God's wanting you to take a step of faith. God's wanting you to step out and to begin to do what he's commanded you to do. As a matter of fact, it, it could even be this way. July 5th, they have serve day. Do you know why you should participate in serve day? Here I am. I'm back to being that parent going, zoom, 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 open up. Do you know why you should participate in serve day? Do you have any clue? Are you ready for this? Because it's inconvenient. It means you're going to have to change your schedule to somehow do the command of Christ to take love to a community because he said, when you do it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be fun. Matter of fact, it's probably going to be humid and hot. Not one amen. But you need to do it. Some of you need to go on that Kentucky mission trip. Do you know why? It's inconvenient. It means you're going to have to redo your life to somehow fulfill the command of Christ to go and share the love of, love of Christ with the world. And I can just tell you, do you know what's going to happen before you do something like that? Do you know what's going to happen right before the mission trip? Are you ready for this? Are you excited? Uh, all hell's going to break loose on you. <laughs> Don't check note to self. Don't go on the mission trip. No. Why is all hell going to break loose on you? Because I, we're afflicting the comfortable. And when you start getting out of your comfort zone, the enemy's not going to like it. And as you get ready for the Word of God to come through you, you have to watch out. The Word of God's going to start working in you. And as it starts working in you, the devil's not going to like it, and he's going to try to stop it. But it's going to be similar to what happened with this last mission trip. I came and I picked him up from the airport, and they're all just like, Oh, look what God did. And I'm like, Y'all are different than the crew that left. Why? Because you inconvenienced yourself for the cause of Christ. Sometimes you're going to have to remember the old song we used to sing at the church. The world behind me. The cross before me. No turning back. No turning back. I want to close with this this morning. You see, there was one other point I told you to notice, and we're going to come around to that. The Word says that God said, and I will establish a covenant a covenant with you. But I will establish my covenant with you and you're going to enter in to the ark of safety. I want to talk to you about the covenant of God. When God establishes a covenant, he sends you reminders of the covenant. The other day, I remembered the covenant God made with the earth that he would never flood it the way that by, by, destroy it by flooding again when I saw a rainbow in the cloud. I thought I'd had, I had just won the jackpot because uh, all of a sudden we got home and I saw a second rainbow in the cloud. Two reminders of God's faithfulness. I'm going to talk to you this morning about the reminder that we handed you on your way in. As a matter of fact, if you came in late, maybe you're in the balconies or somewhere, and you didn't receive one of these, we want to give you one 
uh, this morning. Uh, you should have the elements of communion. If you didn't receive the elements of communion, could I just see your hand and, and our team's going to bring several to my left over here, several to my right, right here. Pastor Todd's going for that. Some in the back, way on the left. Keep your hands up. They're coming around right now with those. Any in the balconies or we're good in the balcony? All right, just hold them up. They're coming around too. We're going to remember in closing today the covenant making God. Just get those in your hands. It's the kind of God we come to worship. The kind of God we come to serve today. He said, I'm going to make a covenant with you. In other words, I'm going to make you a promise that cannot be broken. I'm going to seal it. And the way you sealed the covenant was with bread and, and wine, bread and juice, from the grape and from the, the wheat of the, the earth. They bring both those elements together and a new covenant would be established. He said, I'm going, to, I'm going to remind you of something because we're going to make a covenant together. God said, we're in this thing together because that's the beauty of a covenant. The only way a covenant can work is when both sides are all in. And so God said, I'm going to establish a covenant. And I'm going to come all in. The Bible says it this way. This is what the Apostle Paul said. I, I received this from the Lord himself. He said, on the night that it was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he, and he blessed it. And he said, this is my body which is broken for you. And then he says, do this in remembrance of me. And, and then after dinner, he, in the like manner, he took the cup and he, he drank it. And, and, and after he blessed it, he had drank from it. And he said, he said this is the, the new covenant in my blood. And he said, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, I want you to do this in remembrance of me. Now, now before we go there and receive the elements this morning, I, I want you to understand what he was saying. He said, he said, I give you my body, I give you my blood, I'm going all in to this covenant. He said, I'm all in. And he said, what I want you to do is I want you to have moments where you remember that I went all in for you because what I'm asking you to do is come all in for me. And he said, I know you're going to struggle with that because... I know you. I made you. And I know you're going to have weaknesses, and I know you're going to have challenges, and I know you're going to fail, and I know you're going to have all these issues, but I still love you, and I still am in covenant with you. And so what I want you to do is remember that we're all in, God says, and now you're going to be all in. This is what the Bible says. It says, let a man examine himself lest he receive this remembrance of God's all-inness in an unworthy manner. So let him search his heart and see if there's sin in his life. And really, I think we can interpret it this way this morning. What he's really saying is, I want you to search your heart and see what area of your life you're not all-in. What area of your life are you holding back? What area of life is there sin? Because when you remember a God who went all the way, he says, don't come into this unless you're willing to go all the way let you take a moment and examine yourself. So I want every head bowed and every eye closed. And I want you to think about that for just a moment. I don't know about you, but my, uh, my area is the first thing that comes to my mind. And God's saying, give me that area. Repent of it as the sin it is. Repent of that anger. Repent of that pride. Repent of that lust. Repent of that, that, that lying. Repent of that uh, doubt. Repent of that stubbornness. Re re repent of that thievery. I mean, whatever it is. Just repent of it. The area that you've not been willing to go all in for God, he says, come all in now. Come all in. Because I'm all in on the other side of this cup. Nobody looking around. Everybody praying. I want to ask you a question. How many of you, just like me, you know that area that you need to confess? Can I see your hand? Yeah. You put those down. The Bible says that if we confess, He is faithful and just to forgive us. Now let me ask you this. Maybe you're here today, and you say, Pastor Don, I know that I've not gone all in for God because I've never completely surrendered my life to Him. Maybe you prayed a prayer, but you've You've not given your life to Jesus. Maybe you never prayed a prayer. You know you've not gone all in for God, and you're wondering why and how you can fix your life, but I'm telling you the best place to start, the only place to start, is 
it's all in. And this morning, this is your time. This is your moment. If you're here today and you say, Pastor Don, I, I'd like for today to be the day I give my life to Jesus or I rededicate my life to Christ to go all in for God. I'm not going to embarrass you any more than anybody else who just raised their hand. I want to see your hand right where you are. If today's the day you want to give your life to Jesus Christ, can I see your hand? Would you just hold that up right where you are? I just want to thank you, sir. Is there another? Is there any that would join this brave man? This is your moment. This is your time. This is your place. All right, we're going to pray with this one. And as we pray with them, we're going to pray the prayer of salvation. But we're going to also be confessing these other sins of our lives. When we're repenting and we know that God's setting them free from their sin, that area that you've not gone all in for God, I want you to repent of that area right there. And I want you to help me. I want you to, all of us, help me pray with this one this morning who's given their life to Christ. Help me pray right now. Jesus, by faith, I believe your promises. Heavenly Father, I am a sinner in need of a Savior. By faith, I believe Jesus came for me, he died for me, and now he lives for me. And now I repent of my sins. By faith, in Jesus' name, I am forgiven. By faith, I declare from this moment forward, all that I am belongs to God. Heavenly Father, I believe you are my Father. I believe heaven is my home. And I declare Jesus is my Savior.